earth. Father, we have gathered here for the purpose of worshiping you. And Father, through your spirit, through new life in Christ, through the work of regeneration, we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And so, Father, as we gathered here today, uh, we always have many things running through our minds, many things that encroach upon us, many things that cause us to uh, not be focused. And I, I pray that you would check all those things at the door and that you would help us to, to be fully engaged with our minds, our affection, and our will as we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen.
and to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Charlie, hand me one of those. Thank you. Thank you. I failed to make mention of that. Uh, to close our time of worship this morning, we will be celebrating, commemorating, observing, in faithful obedience, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. Uh, Who's to take part of that? Those who are true followers of Christ, those who have been born from above. Uh, and so we ask that sometime between now and the close of the service that uh, you would come and, and take of a communion set. Probably not every time that we sing that song, but most of the time, my mind goes to John 17, 3, where Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And I believe it's true that when a person really comes to know God and is known by God, is born from above, the Spirit dwells within, uh, there's a desire to want to know God more. And we see that in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, that was Paul's desire to, to grow in his knowledge of Jesus Christ, to, to grow in him, uh, to know more of him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of the suffering. He, he wanted to know that. And where are you at today in the fact of, of, of knowing God and being known by God? And is there a desire within your heart to better know him? Turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19. We returned to Luke's gospel last Sunday. Uh, we, you viewed it in way of a recorded message, recorded Thursday night. Uh, a dear sister said to me, you know, when you, when, you, when you do your recordings, you're a little bit more on your notes and you're a little bit more. I said, well, yes, that's true. I said, but there's a reason for that. I said, I record usually Thursday night. And I haven't had the time for it to really soak in and for it to be just more or less, as Warren Wiersbe once said, the overflow of your heart. I said, so I, yeah, I'm a little bit more at point. Uh, and I, and I, I, I valued that input, by the way. But <clears throat> another thing is, it's out of my norm. And when something's out of my norm, I'm not as comfortable. And so I'm looking for little safeguards, even my notes, and I'm sort of just stuck to those. And uh, so you take me outside of a, of a normal Sunday morning, uh, a Tuesday night Bible study, which, by the way, it's men's and ladies this Tuesday night. Is that correct? Men's and ladies this Tuesday night. Uh, take me out of that, or I'm, put me in that, I'm comfortable. Put me in Wednesday nights at Faith Bible Study, uh, I'm comfortable. But don't let that comfort, don't misunderstand that. Uh, I, I still come up here relying on God, and, and it is with fear and trembling. And it is, uh, as the psalmist said, you know, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So regardless whether I look comfortable up here or not look comfortable up here, regardless of whether I stick to my notes or not stick to my notes, I just want you to know it's only by the grace of God that I, I am here and I have a desire to be here and to, to share his word. So, we, so last week you did, uh, we looked at Luke chapter 19, the first 10 verses. We looked at a very common story, but it was, it's real story, it's history. As Jesus was coming into Jericho and making his way to Bethany and then to, uh, to Jerusalem, we, we read of Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus, depending on your, your pronunciation of it, and, and a very familiar story. So that's where we were at last week. I won't spend any more time. I will resort back to that just shortly. But let's look at verses 11 through 27 this morning. So we have returned to Luke's gospel. We're slowly going through Luke's gospel. We break away every now and then for some reason or another. We line by line go through this. And uh, the series 
the life and times of Jesus according to Luke's gospel. So starting with verse 11. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom or they supposed the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And he came to the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you're an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring these, or bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Harsh. Our Father in heaven, again, we thank you for this time this morning. We're grateful to come together. I'm grateful to come together as a local body here, part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, grateful for a time of corporate worship. Holy Spirit of God, you're the author of this word, and I pray that you would take this word. I, I pray that you would uh, allow it to be as we read in your word, like well-driven nails. I pray that you would use this for the calling and drawing of God's children. I pray that you would use this for the building up, the edifying of God's children. I pray that you would use this to bring people out of darkness and into light, people out of spiritual death and into life. I pray that you would use this, God, for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't know how early in the journey it began, but from the back seat I heard, are we there yet? None of you probably have a clue of what I'm talking about, right? And a little while later, are we there yet? Nobody, we're not, we're not there yet. Probably when this gets close to three o'clock, we'll, we'll be there. And honestly, I loved hearing that. I don't know <clears throat> what was going inside or going on inside of my five year old grandson. I, I believe are we there yet was with some anticipation of being around his his cousins and being around family. As the journey continued, I don't know if it got to be are we there yet? Because I'm tired of being in this, confined to this seat and I just want out. Well, we finally arrived. We're now there. 
You might be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with Luke chapter 19? Nothing. I just didn't have a better inroad. I didn't have a better segue to go with this. Now, really, when you stop and think about it, how do, how do you view your life here as a follower of Christ in a journey? Uh, how, how is your, if you will, are we there yet? What, what is your attitude with that? Is there anticipation of, of what awaits us? You know, and whether that is Christ's return or us going home. I, I hear people, and I understand it to an extent, and I'm not quite there yet. Where Solomon in Ecclesiastes talks about the days coming when we say we have no pleasure in them. I understand to an extent when older people and people ridden with a lot of health issues, just why don't you come back, Jesus, or why don't you just take me home? Are we there yet? How many understand what I'm getting at this, or getting at? Because I'm not sure I do. But <clears throat> I, I believe for the child of God who who loves God, who is grateful to Him, desires to want to live their faith out. The are we there yet is lived in great anticipation and expectation. And really, if you will, fuels the fire for us to live with zeal. We have a desire to be with the one who loved us and washed us of our sins in his own blood. We desire to, to experience what we sang about here and those, those anthems that we find in Revelation. Uh, we desire for that to, to see that, uh, no longer walking by faith, but now by sight, and to experience all of God's glory and all of God's goodness. And so we do with, live with that attitude. Are we there yet? But what are we to do until we are there? What are we to do until he does return? Two words, and it's found in today's title. And that is to be faithful, and that is to be fruitful. And I truly believe if somebody has been genuinely born from above, the Spirit of God therefore dwells within, the Spirit of God therefore has sealed unto the day of redemption, that there is the desire, there is the enabling, there is the empowering to want to live and to live fruit, faithful, fruitful lives. And I believe in our passage here today, we see that. We see the expectation of the followers of Christ. Let, let's start unpacking these verses that we looked at. Eric, if we can have the first one up on there. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem, because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. If you just look at the verse, it gives us reason to under, or there is an explanation of why Jesus spoke this parable, why he spoke this story. He often spoke in stories. He, he took things of everyday life, put it in story form, and to drive home a spiritual truth. And so here he is doing that again. But it first says, now as they heard these things, I would want to say, what things? What did they hear? Well, let's look at what they heard. So let's go back to verse 9 and 10. And some of you are thinking, there you are again. You just worked through those 10 verses last week. We're never going to get through Luke. Well, we're going to look at verses 9 and 10. Some of you may not have been here. Some of you may have. And if you're like me, you just need to be reminded of things. This is a wonderful, true story. Remember, it was, here's another least likely. Zacchaeus comes to Christ, that, rook, that, that crook, that traitor. 
That rotten tax collector working for Rome, he comes to know Christ? Yeah, because we're saved by grace through faith. And we read <laughs> Jesus saying in Zacchaeus' home, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Not only is he of Jewish descent, but, but spiritually he is a son of Abraham. So when we look at verse 11, and it says, and then when he heard these things, this conversation, the words from Jesus' mouth, and then also the words from Zacchaeus' mouth, which we heard in verses prior to that, which showed Zacchaeus' transformation. And you'd have to go back and review that. But here's a guy that was, he made his living off of ripping off his own people. And now he's given it back. His heart is smitten. He understands by the grace of God that he has been living wrong. And through the salvation that was brought to him, the word salvation, to deliver, to rescue, used oftentimes in various means in the Old Testament, but here bringing spiritual salvation, being spiritually rescued and delivered from sin and, and the penalty. And then we also see in verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. This is Jesus' mission. This is why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And all men are lost without him. That is, this is why he came. So when he said these things, when he said these things, he spoke another parable. So that's a quick review of what Jesus, of what is being said here and why Jesus had come. We see then an explanation, if we can go back to verse 11 now, Eric. He spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Now we're now down to the final days of Jesus' minist earthly ministry. He's making his way to Jerusalem. And so the people, as they're coming near to Jerusalem, because he was near Jerusalem, the people still had in their ideas, although Jesus had told his apostles three times by now, that this is what's going to happen. We're going to Jerusalem. And that the Son of Man would be crucified, buried, and on the third day rise again. But they didn't get it. And none of the other people got it. You see, they were, they were hoping. And we read that in Luke chapter 24. We, we were hoping. This was the one that was to come. To take us out from underneath the tyranny of, of, and the oppression of the Roman government. They were thinking that Jesus, if this really is the Messiah, he would set up his kingdom. We're making, he's making his way to Jerusalem. Surely he's going to set up his kingdom now. But we see in, in this verse here that this is why he spoke this parable to them because he wasn't going to set up his kingdom yet. That is not the reason he came the first time. He came the first time to do what? Well, verses 10, 9 and 10 that we looked at before, to seek and to save that which was lost. They thought that the kingdom would appear immediately. And so Jesus corrected them through using this parable of why he came. And so then he looked in verse 12, we read this, and it's not on the screen. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Now to you and I, this might mean, well, we, we might think, well, I have an understanding of what's being said here. But as it has in your bulletin, the then and there, and it's, we often overlook the then and there. And let me explain what I mean by that. The context. Who were there? Well, there were many people. There were the apostles. There was the other disciples or disciples following Jesus. There's a, this is a huge crowd and it's making its way through Jericho. And so the people of Jericho, and we read about that uh, last week, they all came out to see him. 
So Jesus, through story form, shares really what his ministry is about. And in this story form, they understood to an extent what he was getting at. Because when we read a certain nobleman, meaning a, a prince, a man, a descendant from kings, a person of great authority and power, and we know that Jesus came from the, from the line of Judah. He came from David. We know that Jesus is the Son of Man, the Son of God. We know that from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve tribes, we know that through you could trace the lineage of Jesus and see that He is royalty, but we also understand and know that He is the Son of God. Truly, He is a nobleman. But here's something that you probably don't know, or perhaps you do, and I don't mean to question your, your intelligence on this. But here's something that for a lot of those people there, this clicked. And so for a summary from a few commentaries, let me read this to you. The following parable was rich in historic allusions. Kings in Roman provinces like Galilee and Perea actually went to Rome to receive their kingdoms. The entire Herodian dynasty was dependent on Rome for ruling power. And Herod the Great himself had gone to Rome to be given his kingdom. And so Jesus probably derived uh, the details of this parable from the actual history of Archelaus, uh, the son of Herod the Great, who did come into power in 4 B.C. So again, we're talking real places, real people, real time. And so after Herod's death, Archelaus went to Rome to receive the rule over part of his father's kingdom in accordance with the intentions of his father's testament. Its confirmation by the Roman emperor was necessary because Herod's empire in reality formed part of the Roman empire. Hang, in, hang with me here. A Jewish deputation at that time also went to Rome to dispute Archelaus's claim to kingship. We don't want this guy to rule over us. Look at verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And we know it has more implications than that. But as Jesus is telling this story, there's many there in Jericho who, okay, we're connecting the dots here. We're seeing where this parable is going. And some, by God's grace, would have understood Jesus' place in this parable as well. Archelaus restored, restored the royal palace at Jericho. Uh, he, he surrounded it with groves of palms, with balsam plantations, gardens. And then he, then he uh, founded a city and named it after himself. So again, many of the people there would have been thinking about when, when they heard the words... Uh, a certain nobleman went into a far country. Really, this, il this parable illustrates that Jesus was to depart, was to be ascended into heaven, receive his kingdom, and that in time would come back. There's really a couple points here in this today. One, uh, as far as the people involved, we, we see the nobleman, we see the citizens, and we see the servants. And, and we see the generosity of the nobleman. We see the responsibility of what had been entrusted to the servants. Uh, we see the hatred of the citizens. Uh, we see a day of reckoning, if you will, uh, called in for an account of what the servants had done with what was entrusted to them. Uh, we see judgment coming on the faithless servant and on those who hated Jesus. That's a quick summary of what is going on here. So let's look at verses 13 and 15, Eric, if we can have them together. So he called ten of his servants... Delivered to them ten minas and said to them, Do business till I come. 
Now, some of you might be saying, well, this sounds a lot like Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents. There's similarities here, but, but there's difference here too. I, I don't believe it is the same. I don't think it's Luke's version of, of the talents. That's my personal opinion. And we'll probably speak a little bit more about that parable next week. Uh, a minus. What is a minus? It's a, it's a measure of money. Uh, scholars say it's about three to four months wage for the average worker. But I don't think we need to get bogged down in, in those type of details. What I think is the point here is, so this nobleman, he, he calls ten of his servants together and he gives them each uh, a minor. He gives them each a measure of value, of, if you will. In fact, later on in the parable, we read the term money. But he gives them something of worth, and he tells them to do what with it? Do business with it. Do business till I come. In other words, I'm giving this to you. Now you go out there and increase it. You go out there and put it to use. I think the King James might say occupy. Really, it means to take it, and to put it to work, put it to use. You say, well, you may be sitting there, no, you are sitting there, but you may be thinking, well, how's this tie with me? Are you a servant of Christ? Have you been entrusted with something? Are you responsible with what you do with that? Am I responsible for what I do with it? The answers are yes. I don't know if you're a servant of Christ. You know that. God knows that. But as we unpack this, I, I, I pray that you, that, that when you walk out here, you can say, you know, I know, I, I know I'm truly a servant of Christ. And thank you for the reminder of what I'm supposed to be doing. And if nothing else accomplished today, and I, I rest that God's word doesn't return void. I'll be grateful for that. Uh, and knowing that God's word doesn't return void. And to know that some have been reminded of what our responsibility is as a child of his. And so he, he calls them and he sends them out. And again, not getting tied up in the details. But each one of them given a measure wherein the, uh, the parable uh, of the talents they're given different amounts. Where here they're all given the same. They're given one mind. Do business. Now, I skipped to verse 15. Verse 14 we've already read, but you know, let's look at it again. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Really, the citizens here, the Jewish people, uh, who professed to be the subjects of the kingdom of God, but... Many were not. And they did hate him. Didn't most of the Jews hate Jesus? Isn't there a deep hatred for him yet today across the globe? Hey, we're okay if we just talk about God. Let's just talk about God. Just talk about God. That's okay. That's palatable for a lot of people. Because they may have their God. You may have your God. Start mentioning the name of Jesus and now things get a little bit ouchy. Remember what the prophet Isaiah said, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, gr grief and we hid as it were our faces from him. He's despised. He was despised, we did not esteem him. In John's gospel we read, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Uh, if you can hold your finger there in, in, in your place and, or wherever and turn back to John 15 just for a quick moment. This is to stir you a little bit and take you out of your slumber. Uh, but I also just want to emphasize on this whole matter of verse 14 that his citizens, citizens hated him. In verse 18, and this is the uh, from the upper room discourse, and as they make their way to uh, the Gethsemane, you know, it's, it's the 11 now, Judas had departed. And in verse 15 or 18 of John 15, Jesus says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You know, we're, we're entrusted with the gospel. 
And we're to go out and bring increase and be fruitful. But I think we forget that we're doing so in a hostile environment for the most part. Let me understand that. This is part of the reason why I'm reading this. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they did not know him who sent me. They didn't know God. Very religious. Here's the hand-planted vine. Israel. God's people. And for the most part, they rejected him. They didn't know God. They did not know him who sent me. If I, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. They rejected him. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin, but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So when we look at verse 14 of Luke 19, we understand Jesus' point, but his citizens hated him. Well, let's look at verse 15. It's still on the screen for you. And so it was that when he returned. Now, in, in looking at this, this is the return of Christ. All right, uh, he, he came, right, the first time to seek and to save the lost. He, he came to pay the price for our sins. He, he came to bring reconciliation. Us who were apart from God, by nature children of wrath, he came to bring us into God's family to be adopted, to be accepted in the Beloved. That's why Jesus came. To take you and I who were spiritually dead and separated from our sins, Isaiah 59, and bring us back into reconciliation with God. That's why He came. And He paid the price. And the Father was satisfied. And he ascended to the heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. He lives to make intercession for us. And he's coming again. And so when we look at verse 15, this is picturing Jesus' return. And so it was when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Does Jesus know that already? Absolutely he knows that. But again, Jesus is using this story to help us understand. He, he did it for the reason to let them know that he wasn't established in this kingdom yet when he went to Jerusalem. That that was not the reason for him to come the first time. And he also used this story to show us what his servant's responsibility is. And so we see the response of those servants. Yeah, if we can have that on the screen, please, Eric. Then came the first. And keep in mind, he is coming again. We're not there yet. He's not returned yet. But, but I, I pray that we wait with eager anticipation and that we are zealous in our faith and our fruitfulness by His grace. The same grace that saves us is the same grace that enables you and I to be faithful and fruitful. So then came the first <clears throat> saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. I think it's important that we catch this. First of all, so the one comes, and again, this is just story, but, it, but there's definitely inferences to be made here. Master your mina. 
Who's getting the glory and the honor here? God is. <laughs> Master, my, my, my Lord, here, here's what you're mine of. Here's what you entrusted. By your grace, you gave me this, and this is what has taken place with it. I'm acknowledging you as master. I'm acknowledging you are the one who has gifted this and who has entrusted this. He doesn't say, here is my mina. Here is what my mina has done. The response, well done, good servant. Well done. Because you were what? You were faithful. In very little, have authority over ten cities. Now, doesn't God's word say, to whom much is given, much is expected? And so, here is the privilege of, okay, you were faithful, now be faithful over more. Yeah, the capacity to better serve God, the capacity to bring Him more glory and honor. And we don't need to take literally, well, here's ten kingdoms, or here's ten cities. The point is this. That, they're, that the servants of God, the faithful, fruitful servants of God will be rewarded. And He is glorified in that. You and I do not earn our salvation. We don't work to be saved. But if we've truly been born from above, there'll be evidence of it. And faithfulness and fruitfulness are two things that are, 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 will be seen. Look at Zacchaeus' life. L look how quickly. <laughs> I mean, today I must stay at your house. And quickly we see the transformation God worked in his life. We see faithfulness and we see fruitfulness in his life. Zacchaeus, well done. It is the Lord's gifting, the Lord's giving, and our responsibility to do well with it. To do well with it. Well, let's look at the second servant. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Now, I've, I've read and I've listened to messages and such, and I'm not going to try to di uh, make distinctions here, but I see this. I see faithfulness, and I see faithfulness rewarded. What applications can we make before we even look to the last servant that's here? And to the ones who hated them, which we'll do next week. I want us just to think about this. You and I, if, we, if you have been born from above, we've been entrusted with the gospel, the good news message. In Matthew, in chapter 13, we read where the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man fell, found and hid, and for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant sinking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What is this dis depicting here? This is saying this, <clears throat> that when we come to Christ, we realize that the gospel, the good news of Christ, the, the truth that we go from being spiritually dead to now spiritually alive, that the life of Christ has come, we have new eternal life, and we are sold out to that truth. 
We also understand, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, where, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be found, may be of God and not of us. And so that's an understanding that, look, I am just a dirt ball. All right, maybe translations don't say that, but jars of clay, I think the NIV, earthen vessels. Look, it's it's not the container, because we're all broke, we're all marred. And my, 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 my joy is not in this container, my joy is what's in this container, the, the treasure that is there. And so, since I've been entrusted with this treasure, I am called to share this treasure with others. Understanding, again, as Paul says, one plants and one waters, and it's God who brings the increase. And what He calls me to do is to be faithful in planting and watering. And sometimes we can get discouraged because we don't see fruit, we don't see results. That's That's not my part in this. In order to hear the well done, good and faithful, we're to be faithful. We're to be living out what God has put within. And so let me transition with our memory verse for this month, if we can have it, Eric. So here's clearly an application. And here is what we're to draw from the parable that Jesus gave as his followers. Because let me tell you, you you and I are somewhere in that narrative that we read. You're either a faithful servant, you're a faithless servant, or you're someone who hates God. You say, well, no, no, I don't fit in any of those. I'm in church, aren't I? Church isn't necessary fruitfulness. Being church isn't necessarily faithfulness. Do you understand that? If you've been born from above, my dear friends, you have received the gift, the greatest gift ever. Uh, The treasure that should cause us to sell out everything. Uh, The pearl of great price. We have received a gift And we are called to minister it to one another. And we're called to be good stewards, good managers of what has been entrusted. The, the manifold or the ESV, the varied grace of God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I pray that today was a matter of at least challenging our hearts of where where do we fit in this story are are, are we a servant uh, do we have this this the, the treasure of the gospel within uh, are we being faithful with it or are we just sitting on it are we just folded it up in a in a handkerchief and just put it away like a baptism certificate or a confirmation certificate or something i, ha- I have this i'll keep it in safekeeping When my time comes, pull that out to show that I'm a servant and that I'm good to go. Could could that be, Father, what some are relying on? Or if the truth be known, is is coming to church and being involved in activities just just to cover, just a seeking of men's approval, to be good in the eyes of community, you do the work, Father, in our lives and as, as your children. Help us to be good ministers of what, good stewards of what you have entrusted to us. And Father, as we now come to the table, and we do so in remembrance of Christ, we do so in obedience to this ordinance that he has given to his church, his body, his bride, uh, to remember, to commemorate the great price that was paid so that we could be recipients uh, of new life, be recipients uh, of that that treasure, uh, the glorious gospel of sinners being made into saints.
So in the closing moments, as we do close this time with, with the Lord's Supper, Lord, I, I pray that you would minister. And I pray, Father, we, we fall, we fail, and we know that our salvation is by grace. We know that our sanctification is by grace. And, and we know that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if there are truly, so the people here today, as we come to the table, as we pick up these communion sets and, and take of it, uh, I pray that those who are truly born from above will take part and that uh, though we may have sinned this past week, though we may have fallen short, that we would remember the truth that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as we read in your word, as the Apostle Paul says, uh, so let us eat of the bread and let us drink of the cup. That's your desire, that your children be obedient in this, in this uh, ordinance. So I draw your attention, uh, one last slide taken from Luke's gospel. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Followers of Christ, children of God, let us take of the bread. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. In remembrance of Jesus giving his very body, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, giving his body uh, in remembrance of that by the seed of this bread. God's word is clear. tells us in the Old and the New Testament that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And Jesus said that this, this cup represents... His blood, it represents uh, his lifeblood and him giving that, giving his lifeblood for the forgiveness of our sins. In remembrance of Christ, let us drink of the cup. We'll close in a, with a worship song.
Amen and Father, we thank you. I hear the Apostle Paul's word, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so, Father, may we be proclaimers of the good news of Christ. May we be proclaimers of the assured hope that we have in him. Proclaimers, uh, Father, empowered by your spirit to speak of the love of Christ, the peace of Christ, the joy of Christ. Uh, Lord, to live out this treasure within, the treasure of the good news. Help us to be ambassadors, Father, for your glory, for your honor, and all that we think, all that we say, all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.